All righty. Hello, everybody, and, and welcome to this session on networking. Uh, my name is Annina Huhtala, and I am the content director at 100. 100 is a global nonprofit uh, in education based in Finland. And our main job is to identify and share scalable um, education innovations. And the not so secret sauce to our work is our fantastic network. So very much aligned with the, with the topic of today. So we, what we do, we could not do this without our global community of 27 country leads, over 800 ambassadors, 100 youth ambassadors, an academy of over 150 education experts from all around the world. So um, I want to also give a shout out to the mother, the head and the soul of this community. My colleague Katija Aladdin is in the, in the background. Yay, claps, hearts. <laughs> She's making sure that all of us stay uh, on schedule, that everything works. Um, and uh, okay, so how how is this like, where does this workshop, uh, where is it sort of like placed? So it's, it's part of our biggest celebration of the year, the 100 Innovation Summit. And in this this uh, this festival, how like if I would like to, if I can use that word, we get together with the whole community to celebrate the leading education innovators. And on Wednesday, we launch our global collection for 2022. It includes uh, the 100 best education innovations globally, and one of the selected innovations. Uh, or innovators is Inhive, uh, who we have an honor to host today's workshop. So Jan, maybe one more wave the, so that everybody understands that it's you. Hello there. So Inhive is a team of professional uh, network builders who create connections and, and shortcuts to young people to get ahead in life. So I am super excited uh, about today's, today's workshop, uh, as you can probably see. <laughs> and as we get to, like, the thing is, like, I what I love about this is that we actually get to not just listen, but also uh, talk and build those networks that we're talking about. So I'd like to ask you once more, if only your connection allows, if possible, please put your camera on, keep it on as much as possible because that gives us human beings that sense of connection. Uh, and no worries if your house is a mess. I have repairmen walking around in my house right now. So, so like anything can happen. But um, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Uh, let's add one more sense in this mix. That is sound. So we'd like to kick off this session and invite you participants to speak up. Join breakout rooms when you get to meet other participants. And uh, as a warm up, warm up conversation, warm up questions, we've uh, crafted a few. Let's see if I can find the slide. Here we go. Yay. Did something change? I hope. No, of course not. Life is not that simple. Uh, well, anyways, un momento, it's here. Okay, so these are the two questions that we'd like you to think while you're in the, in the breakout room. Um, so say yes when you're split in the rooms and I'll see you in a bit. Hey, I'm sure you all had wonderful conversations. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think my brain is still so deprived of social interactions that just the kind of chance to get in a room with with strangers not strangers anymore just makes get, gets my dopamine rushing so so thank you um if your new contact said something really smart or encouraging or inspiring thought provoking please don't keep it to yourself but you can share it on the chat um also um yeah yeah if you have like if you want to share it right now just open your mic and shout it out or then we read the, maybe we'll read the comments. Uh, thank you, I see them coming, fantastic. Um, as the headline of this session promises, we are talking today about net networks that have a power for transformative social change and also in the sco scope of uh, education. So I think it's time for me to hand over 
um, hand over the uh, the lead to Jan Mikhalko, uh, who is a professional networker and a senior project lead at InHive. So Jan, uh, please take the stage. Um, over to you. Thanks, Anina, um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introductions and for starting off the conversation in small groups. So a um, uh, quick warm welcome on uh, my behalf, on behalf of my colleagues at InHive, our team, um, and also on behalf of the amazing speakers and panelists uh, who are with us today. And I also want to say a huge thank you um, for finding the time in your busy schedules uh, to, to be on this panel and to share your insights and experiences um, from researching or um, starting and nurturing various networks, um, whether it is networks of uh, university alumni or networks of women in science, young leaders, scholarship recipients, uh, fellows in teaching uh, profession from around the world. So uh, a huge thank you for, for being here and a warm welcome to, to everyone. Um, I will provide just a little bit of a framing or an introduction a little bit uh, deeper into the, the session and hopefully it will be a good platform to start the, the conversation. Um, yeah, the basics um, uh, of the um, Zoom platform are there for you. Please do keep coming, um, uh, keep sharing your um, uh, comments or questions throughout. I will um, tell you a little bit more about how the session will be run in just a minute. And of course, um, the session is being recorded um, and we will follow up with some additional materials um, afterwards. So in terms of the uh, quick rationale behind um, the session today, so um, we decided with uh, the 100 team to hold this workshop as part of the 2021 summit because um, of the, I would say, maybe even now undeniable fact that as a humanity or as various communities in, in our diversity, we face really um, some unprecedented challenges and crises, uh, which are very complex. Um, and I think um, all of us are probably thinking about the climate crisis, which has been in front of our minds with the COP26 um, taking place in Glasgow. But I think, you know, other crises and um, inequities and injustices that are social, economic and political are tied to the climate crisis and are very much interwoven into our global world order. Um, I think the other a big crisis, of course, is COVID-19 pandemic um, that has exacerbated all of these um, uh, inequities. Um, and I think when we think about the education sector in particular, we can think about it in many different examples, whether it is um, about many children missing out on years of schooling um, as a result of the fact that there weren't vaccines available in their countries or because of um, the lack of connectivity and being off grid, not being able to have online uh, remote um, learning. So because of these interlinked um, injustices and inequities, what it means is that we have to work collaboratively. Um, we have to work across geographies, uh, different sectors, across the boundaries of different disciplines, because there is not one single person or an organization or a solution that will actually address all of these complexities. So that is why we are um, here today. And we at InHive, as, as Anina has uh, mentioned already, we specialize in building networks as a, as a means of organizing people for transformative change in their communities. Um, and in particular, we actually focus um, a lot on school graduates. So building networks of alumni who are often underused uh, in the education sector as a source of knowledge and information or of social and um, economic capital. So we, we see networks as kind of these purposely built and nurtured connections amongst individuals but also amongst organizations or even in a mix of both and which allow us to circulate knowledge and information to learn from one another and with one another um, to have a community where you feel like you belong with whom you share certain vision and purpose and so that we together work uh, because we know we're more than just some of our parts but we work collectively 
So I think just to give a few examples where we have seen networks um, over the last few um, months or years of the COVID pandemic, for example, be mobilized is, um, you know, when you think about you needed to identify somebody who will help you design an online curriculum, right? Because that's something we didn't know. So you used your network to identify the right person to help you address that need or to help you with running community-based teaching because, you know, we couldn't go to school. But even more so, for example, in some communities where economic activity was impossible, where we couldn't be together, you know, to distribute food and basic necessities. Um, uh, so to stop people from falling into poverty or desperation, um, and especially we think about uh, women of color being much more affected in this area. Um, so networks were mobilized to address these uh, needs. So we know that networks can be effective in this way as a, to collaborate and connect. Um, and we wanted to create a space in this summit where we can learn and share with one another what are the best practices about network building or network weaving and mobilizing networks to um, deliver impact and meaningful and transformative change. But I think I, I don't want us to forget that there is also that kind of very personal and individual level benefit that networks brings. I think there is something about scale and systems change, but also there is something on that individual level. Um, so, for example, at InHive, we work, as I said, uh, with secondary schools, and when we try to um, ascertain how alumni networks can be helpful uh, at a school level uh, with, uh, for example, secondary um, school um, students, we ask um, these young people, you know, who do you call? Um, and hopefully some people had the same mindset as I did when I hear the question is Ghostbusters. I hope that that's the, not necessarily who you call, but it is about asking who do you call when you need advice, for example, you know, when you don't know which um, uh, subjects to take if you want to go into become a teacher what do you have to do to to get um, to that space or who do you call when you need advice about that first job as a secondary school student when you're thinking about your future um, and so so we we do these questioning so that we can help schools build alumni networks with a purpose and for that transformation for the for the young people so just to wrap up this kind of introductory uh, conversation, I hope what you're getting out of these different um, examples is that networks are diverse. And as a result, the network uh, building process will take different um, shape and form depending on its purpose, but also depending on the context where you are and where you work. Um, I know that some of us are kind of facing with, um, faced with certain stereotypes about what networks are, what networking looks like. Um, probably that's something that was part of your conversations at the beginning when you were reflecting about networking. Um, but hopefully you will hear from, the, from our speakers today that, you know, um, uh, there are many different ways of doing this and your journey with your network will be very unique. Um, and hopefully you will hear from, your, from the panelists what their unique experiences are and you can um, learn from those. So this, the workshop is set up into kind of two discussion um, segments where we will have um, questions being discussed by our panelists. And then we'll go into breakout groups again. So after each segment, you will be allocated into a small group of about four people. Well, you will have the opportunity to reflect together on what you heard from the panelists, but also to come up with questions that you want to share. So I encourage you in your group to kind of identify that one person who would be willing to share your questions or um, uh, reflections in the chat function when we come back. And the speakers will answer a few of those um, time permitting. So I will um, encourage now all the panelists to turn their cameras on if they haven't done so yet um, and invite them to the stage. Um, and um, I have to apologize in advance for not being able to completely uh, give justice to your great biographies and achievements. Those will be circulated um, uh, after the session, uh, but just as a quick way of welcoming, we have Dr. Maria Gallo joining us. Um, yes, uh, who is the author of The Alumni Way and founder of the Alumni Way Academy. Um, then uh, we have Professor Rana Dajani. Rana, can, uh, hello, uh, who is the founder and director of We Love Reading, also part of the 100 uh, community. So uh, welcome and congratulations for that as well. 
Um, then we are joined by Margot Jacquemin, um, who is the Director of Alumni at Enseña por México. Um, hello to you as well, welcome. And finally, last but not least for sure, um, Joseph Munyambaza, who is joining us from the MasterCard Foundation, where he is the Scholars Program Consultant. So welcome everyone to the speakers. Um, and so now, as I said, we will start with our first discussion, uh, which will be for about 10 minutes. Um, and our panelists will tackle the question um, that uh, you might see. I will, we will post it in the, in the chat as well. But the first question uh, that will panelists are going to answer for us, why is it worth investing in our networks to achieve social impact? And to kick us off, maybe I'll uh, hand the baton over to Maria. Um, Thanks, Jan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, great that you could spend time on Friday with us to discuss this. And I guess the first thing that occurred to me with this question was, what would it be like with the absence of networks, with no networks? And I just imagine people feeling alone, feeling powerless, not able to make, uh, make that social impact or making that change within their community, because it's that collectiveness, it's that sense of belonging that allows us to make, to, to create that kind of connection. And I think for our organizations, whether they are schools or educational institutions or initiatives that we're doing to promote education, that there is this idea of, um, of creating networks and investing in networks because they are the embodiment of our values. And those that want to kind of connect with their, their values are able to connect with us and connect with us as organizations and then want to be able to kind of espouse and to be able to kind of spread that those kind of values out into um, into communities. Uh, and, you know, I was really also struck um, when we were talking about, um, you know, social capital and, you know, how we can build social capital for our networks. And it made me think a lot of the book, if you have the pleasure to read um, Julia Fre uh, Freeland Fisher's book, Who You Know. Um, and she talks about networks. And for those that maybe if you're nodding heads, if you have read this book, it is a really powerful one. And I found it really good. And one of the things she talks about is inherited networks, that we all have powerful networks that are maybe our family, our very close friends, or our um are those that are really close to us, those neighboring kind of communities, but um, those networks are really powerful and important. And they're the people that probably love us and care about us very much. But to be able to expand people's networks so that they have this, this, uh, this wider social capital so that they can make changes in their community, that's the powerful piece. So that's where I'll, I'll take it. And maybe I'll just kind of put a, a, the bat over to um, somebody else. Does anybody else want to take up the, the baton? Go ahead, Rana, yes. Yes, absolutely. I, and I want to just pick off where you, you left off to talk about what are, what are the advantages of, of building these networks and investing in them and putting in your time and effort, because it does take time. Um, in addition to peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and expanding your horizon by listening to other people's opinions who share the same goal, but may arrive at the goal in different ways. And so it makes you reflect back on your own experience and, and rethink a lot of your assumptions um, and, and challenge them. And I think that's important. So feeling uncomfortable within a, a community that you uh, already know that they all have the same goal is, a, is, a, is one way of dealing with that ambiguity and uncomfort to, to think outside the box. Uh, so I think that's an important thing because usually we only talk with people who are very much like us and we shy away from people who are very different. But being part of a network with a common goal helps us you know, kind of overcome that challenge. But also by seeing other people uh, in this network from different backgrounds, but all again, with that goal in mind, um, you learn to, um, appreciate your own opinion and, and to have the confidence to speak out. Uh, and I think that's a, one of the challenges in networks, especially when we're talking about global networks that include global north and global south. Uh, sometimes there becomes a dominance by, by the global north and not always unconscious, but unconsciously it happens. And so being part of that network and listening to people who uh, who are confident and speak up is very important to boost your own confidence and speak up with your own opinion uh, and, and um, helps build your identity so you do better even in your own community. And some of those barriers, for example, is language. 
right? Because if, if the language is in English, like we are here, we're already, uh, you know, excluding some people because they don't understand the language. So by being part of a network and being active, you can start introducing, uh, let's translate, let's, let's uh, talk in a language that other people can converse in to widen that horizon and, and shifting the power dynamics to allow equal equity uh, among everybody in that network to contribute and learn and learning that we can always learn from each other. I'll stop there. I'm sure my colleagues want have other points to add. Yeah, yes. to, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, to like Maria told us what would happen if we don't have networks. I will focus on what happened when we have uh, networks. Like I think it's really worth investing in in networks because of the potential networks hold and because of their impact, like the collective impact. For example, in the Teach for All network. Alumni Network, we are a team that seeks to strengthen the commitment and the connections and the impact of the alumni community in Latin America to transform the system and that prevents a just uh, world for all um, through education. So we build and empower community, inspiring, influencing not only our network, but the world around us. So we do this through shared projects and strategic uh, complementation, communities of practice, connections, and new perspectives, like someone said in the chat, and committees and other. So we want to mobilize and empower this uh, alumni community. And um, from our position, like we understand networks as communities, like people working together. And we, as the community of Head of Alumni in the Teach for Network in Latin America, we decided to build networks to increase our impact and to enhance the collective leadership of our alumni and to increase their impact. So thanks to this network of eight, um, head of alumni, we were able to create like new initiatives and projects and program for our alumni. For example, in the past, um, our event, the Latino Latino, like it's the alumni gathering, it was organized and led by only one country. And now we co-created together, like including more perspectives and ideas. And so it's really more a complete project. And that became a source of inspiration to other countries in the Tishwell networks. And yeah, so we like create networks of alumni uh, around these events and initiatives so they can like connect and work together. And I think the impact is really powerful thanks to this. Like the impact we see, for example, the creation of communities of practice and community led networks like this really, really powerful and like people sharing the same passion and working together. So the, the collective network, I think it's much more powerful and impactful working together than individually. Yeah, I think we, we've, uh, uh, the, the team has exhausted this and I wanted to just add the one thing. Um, so I work with the MasterCard Foundation and, uh, you know, the foundation has set a great ambition uh, to really uh, enable 30 million uh, young people in Africa. And I think more than that, um, to, to enable them to access dignified and fulfilling work. And part of that is really to, to provide them uh, with the skills through education and the other areas which young people need to to really to, to grow and be the best they can. Uh, but along the way, I think the foundation quickly learned that preparing young people, you know, in isolation, you know, from their universities and then back to the community, it, it was it was not um, rewarding very, very well. And so the, the goal was to, uh, to, to help to uh, bring these young people together uh, in a way that they feel um, they are part of the community and uh, by connecting them, because some of them are entrepreneurs, others are looking for uh, employment. And when you realize that these young people get to inspire each other, they learn that they have a bigger purpose. You know, there's that individual passion, individual interest grows into uh, a community interest. And with the mission, you know, to create transformative leaders, I, I think, we realize that we can only achieve it by building a network of young people. And, you know, in our chat uh, before this uh, with Jody and uh, uh, two other uh, members of this uh, event, you know, Jody was sharing how, you know, he comes from Mexico and he was saying that, you know, many of us from developing world, 
we shared same uh, challenges. And by co collaborating, by knowing each other, we also are able to inspire each other and, and support each other. And I think to me, that's a true definition of, of the value of the network and why we should invest in it. Sorry for the background, I'm a, I'm a stay home father here. <laughs> No, that's amazing. Thank you. And um, uh, we, we're slowly coming to, to, to the end of um, uh, this round, but I would love if anyone would like to share further reflections, I think, um, on the global nature of some of the networks you're part of. And for example, the language issues that um, Rana mentioned, have you, um, you know, I know that, for example, that's the, uh, the, the case for MasterCard. I know that's for Teach for All as well, for the community that you are trying to um, deal with. So. Uh, why or how has the, the these networks kind of like invested in bridging those differences or how have they been dealing with these kind of power imbalances? Um, any reflections on that? Uh, I can uh, jump in. So uh, I, I, in, in terms of uh, at We Love Reading, we have a network of uh, We Love Reading ambassadors in 63 countries around the world. And what we're trying to establish, and this is a shout out for the, uh, for the people here in this call, is creating a virtual platform to actually connect them uh, in a way where they can support each other. So, And what we, we're actually piloting this right now. And when I shared with one of our ambassadors in the Zatari camp, a Syrian refugee in Jordan, uh, and she really that she can talk to Maria, who's another Wheel of Reading ambassador in Argentina. She was like over the moon. And the beautiful thing is that, uh, in particular for our network, is that these are people at the street level. Just your everyday person, a mom, a teacher, a retired grandfather, who, who are reading aloud to children. But then imagine that that power of connecting because everybody's doing that same simple thing that we all share as a universal value. So that's one of the reasons, that's one of the pillars uh, for creating a strong network when everybody uh, has the same objective, yet do it in their own special way. Uh, so I think now just to, that was a, like a story, but I also wanted to say one way of, of creating those networks and overcoming the barriers is insisting that everybody speaks their own language and not, not isolating by speaking in English and having the onus on the English speaker because that's the more, uh, let's say the more common and therefore the more dominant and will always exclude the marginalized. And in the end, we have enough of the dominance. We need those marginalized voices. Uh, and so it's about, no, you speak in your language and the onus is on me to figure out how to translate it rather than, because usually the onus is always on the marginalized to figure out how what to do. And so you lose so much, uh, we as a, as a global community miss out on all the wonderful, amazing work that is done by the, the people on the ground, because there's no way. So there's some uh, technology tools, uh, word, Wordly, I think, where they actually can translate instantaneously as we speak uh, in multiple languages. And then we people can volunteer to help translate uh, as we go and be patient. And I think this is, it's about how much we value this. Sometimes we don't value it enough, so let's find an excuse. But if we really, really value it and put it as a priority, we will find a way. Amazing, thank you. Any final um, thoughts from the other panelists before we go into the breakout room? Well, I think everyone has so much to say. We're kind of also um, hopefully in your, your breakout uh, groups now for the next seven minutes or so. Um, you'll be able to reflect on some of the things that you have heard and some of the ta key takeaways. I hope that you took it as an opportunity to uh, meet one another, meet new people. If you can exchange um, LinkedIn, email addresses, WhatsApp numbers, whatever is relevant for you and easiest way. But um, uh, I hope you're taking that as an opportunity to meet new people as well so you can continue the conversations. And, um, uh, and uh, there are other platforms as well for you to continue the conversations even beyond um, uh, this session. And so, um, uh, I also will do a very shameless plug into the work of InHive as, as a place where you can um, learn more about uh, network building and kind of continue the conversation. We have an um, uh, amazing community that we call Nexus, um, where there are people like Maria um, who, are, who are there to uh, exchange, their, um, uh, exchange with others their experiences, insights, resources they are coming through. Um, so I encourage you to, if you're interested in continuing those conversations, to, to link with others and link with us and continue that.
and Joseph is part of our Nexus too. He's he's also uh, one of our Nexus members. So please, you know, consider joining. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Maria. And so um, uh, I hope you had a good conversation. It would be lovely if you, anyone would be willing to put um, their questions or things that you were taking away from your conversations into the chat. Um, and so that the speakers can maybe tackle one question as a way of uh, tying that uh, uh, segment together. So feel free to post it into um, the chat because otherwise I do have uh, questions and I will abuse the power of the chair to pose my own questions for, for, for speakers. But um. So we have um, Darlene, you had uh, a very, very fast finger. So thank you so much for posting the question. It actually ties very nicely to the conversation we were having actually um, in, uh, with, uh, with the, the speakers, which was about the kind of mindset and approaches to actually uh, building your networks. And so um, uh, the question was about how do we facilitate effective networks? And so um, I don't know if there's um, any one of our speakers who would like to maybe um, offer some reflections um, on that. I'll, I'll start. So uh, that's a great question. It's the like $1 million question, right? How do we get these networks up and running uh, to get the most out of them? And sometimes it's not about uh, what the network is about. It's about us as individual members of the network. How do, what are our expectations and how do we perceive ourselves in that bigger picture and that bigger network? And I think most times people, when they become part of networks and members, they have expectations. What are they going to do for me? You know, that feeling of, you know, you're the victim and you're waiting for somebody to come and, and, and help you. And, I, and that's, the, that's not the right mindset. The mindset is you shift how you, you perceive yourself and the network and you think, what can I do for this network? How can I take advantage of this network? And who can I reach out to to talk and learn from? So you become the center as you reach out. And that's, uh, I'm a biologist, by the way. I'm a professor of biology. And that kind of relates to nature. That's how nature works, right? Uh, organisms are not waiting for somebody to come and save them. They're all active members contributing to the ecosystem. And, and that's how you develop those relationships and build that very, those strong relationships and that community where everybody's benefiting. And by the way, when you shift that, perspective. Oh my God, the whole world opens up. Uh, I remember when I became a member of another network called Catalyst 2030, uh, where people as they joined, they were kind of uncomfortable because they weren't sure where they fit in, what was expected. And I told them, it's like you're throwing yourself into the deep end of the swimming pool. Uh, you struggle because you don't know what to do. But if you just relax and start listening and, and, and just absorbing and listening to the stories, you know, the power of a network is storytelling and, and go, going down to the deep personal stories of people, then you start le learning. And so you float. And that's when the win-win happens as you engage uh, with the people of your network. So it's all about setting those expectations in the right place. And then um, you become free. And, and this reminds me, sometimes the expectations is about money or funding or, you know, fame or connections. But it's actually when you, you know, it's like that famous saying, when you ask for money, you don't get anything. But when you ask for advice, you get a lot of things. So, so ask for advice and be there. And that's how you will harness that network and make the most of it. Amazing. Thanks, Rana. And Maria, I know you're a member of the Catalyst 2030 group as well, um, amongst others. And um, any reflections from you in terms of the, the network or uh, things that you have researched and seen in terms of the, the way we, we run networks effectively? Yeah, I think, wow, Rana really kind of, she kind of gave us a really good overview. And I love that analogy about the swimming pool. I think that's something that we can all kind of take away. Um, it really does give us that kind of visual appeal of what you know, how we could kind of approach networks. And I think it's, yeah, I think it is really important for us to be thinking about the generosity within our networks. Uh, and that sometimes, um, as I was saying in during the break time, your little breakout time, I was just saying about this idea of, you know, when we're thinking about our networks, make sure that people understand that there is also the opportunity for generosity on both sides. So sometimes people feel that they're a deficit to a network. I'm here to get something, but I can't provide anything. And I think it's important that we remind everybody that everybody is, um, everybody is uh, is important in the network and everybody has value in the network and that we all have things to contribute and maybe it's different things that they bring to the network um, and that we kind of value that. And I think the, one of the challenges that we all have is to try to find um, those meaningful ways that we can get people involved in the network because they are maybe 
so interested in our values and so interested in wanting to make change and get you know meaningful change and they don't know how to do it so in, so one of the things i would say is you know in that generosity piece is to you know i was talking earlier about this kind of 5 to 1 ratio so every time you think about and when you're involved in a network about the number of things that you can actually bring to a network as opposed to what you're taking out from a network. So if we kind of instill that kind of value system that it's like, well, you know, what are you going to contribute to be, being part of this network? Um, then people go, oh, this isn't just about a take situation. It's a give and take. And I think then there's a lot more value that's that's hold. There's a lot more ownership um, because, the, you know, they feel very valued mm. um, in the network. Amazing. Thank you, Maria. And I think that actually just kind of um, transitions us next, nicely to the next question, which is, I think, thinking about what kind of networks can we build around ourselves, you know, and I think there is those kind of learning networks, there is kind of other um, uh, other types of networks. And so maybe I'll, I'll turn to, to you, Margot, if you don't mind, kind of what is it that you think, you know, some, some people who are thinking about doing impact at scale, what, can, what kind of networks can they build around themselves? Yeah, but we are currently working uh, with different networks of communities of practice and that were created based on a common interest or pathway like public policies, social innovation and school leadership. So these topics brings the network together. I think like uh, Rana mentioned, like the passion is really like the strength of the, the network, like sharing the same passion for education, for example, in our case in the Teach for All network. Sharing this passion like makes it really strong network, and so they are joining forces to increase the impact on this specific area or topic. So I think um, we can see some positive impacts or outcomes of the network, like some individual member stories, or as well as collective impact, like for example the creation of these uh, communities of practice and community-led networks. And I think yeah, the power of the networks is that networks beat the systems in the changing world. Like when the pandemic closed schools, it was often non-governments that proposed solution, but teacher, parents, nonprofits, and other local leaders who banded together using their existing relationships and made, made things happen. So in times of crisis, like informal networks were more effective than formal systems. And we saw that networks are really more important that since systems in our uncertain world so yeah to sum up like innovators can set up or foster informal networks to amplify their impacts joseph please go ahead yeah so i, I wanted to add that i think it's it's very uh, good to be able to create like a sector a uh, focused um, network, uh, especially when you're working with the young professionals, uh, to make sure that everyone needs uh, is is catered for. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's also very important to know uh, to to know that a network is part of an ecosystem. Because, um, like when you're preparing, for example, you know you're supporting young people, uh, you know who are passionate about agriculture, who are passionate about infrastructure. Uh, it is good to know that there's a lot of learning in other sectors which may not be of their interest because, like, you know, industries collaborate. And I think, especially when you're working with the young people, uh, making sure we are able to support with their uh, specific needs or create an environment where they're able to find their specific needs met, but also open them to, to the bigger world. I find that very, very uh, important, especially now. We have many things are changing. You study one thing, two years later, you're doing something else. And you can only get to do that if you're being supported to explore what you, you, you previously thought you're passionate about and also be exposed to other things uh, beyond what you think is your, is your passion. Yeah. Maybe I'd like to comment on what Joseph said, but also reminded us uh, with COVID-19, uh, on how every person matters across the world. You know, uh, uh, you, we used to think, you know, especially the global north thought, you know, we're fine, we're okay. But I think COVID has, COVID has shown us how common our problems and challenges and barriers are across uh, socioeconomic sectors and how important it is that the last person is safe. And that similarly reflects on our networks. If we don't have everybody in, uh, together on a particular issue, then we're not going to be able to uh, succeed in our, in our goal. So I think keeping that in mind is kind of the silver lining 
of COVID. And somebody I had mentioned earlier from the breakout rooms, how with COVID also, because everything's online, the connectivity is easier. We have a chance of talking. We don't have to travel and meet. We can connect online. And that's a, a huge, huge advantage. Uh, we see young people from across the world talking to each other. We see people we've never seen, you know, just talking, collaborating and setting. And, and then there's this, uh, because you're online, you don't have to, you know, culturally correct. What are you dressed up? What are people going to think? All those are gone because you can always turn off your camera or you can say, oh, there was a technical glitch. And, and the, so th this opens up, the, the, to, you know, the courage and to test and try out things. So and, and, and I think most, the last thing I want to say about networks is the this feeling of you're not alone. I think that's so important. Many times, all of us who work in the social sector and, and trying to make, you feel you're alone. You feel that you're the only one and everybody's against you, but just connecting and hearing your, your colleague around the world, what they're doing makes you feel strong and that you're not alone and that it's gonna, it's gonna work. It's gonna end well at some point. Oh, so Maria, did you want to come in? Sorry, I, feel, I, I don't know. Yes, I was going to come in, but then Rana just went with with that kind of gold. No, she the, the gold. I couldn't. How do you how do you kind of uh, how do you match that? Um, as a no, what I, what I was going to just um, say is that you know we sometimes forget that our networks are. Um, are important. I know that this is something that Inhive was always talking about is this idea and the power of like relatable role models and how we can bring that to people. And that, you know, when you're saying what, you know, I think some, some one person's question there was about how do you mobilize a hundred people within a, you know, ambassador. And, you know, that's hard because it, it sometimes it's felt that, you know, it has to be um, mobilized from, you know, one person outwards, but actually there is this idea of creating, um, I think as, as Joseph was saying about this idea of an ecosystem, that we are creating this ecosystem of people that that actually can be part of the network so that they know that they're part of this glow, this bigger goal of maybe providing relatable role models in the classroom or, and that it doesn't always have to be overmanaged. Yes, management is important, but it doesn't have to be overmanaged. It can just be something where people kind of know their expectations and then can, can, can be part of something, um, uh, you know, maybe knowing those expectations, you know, having them, um, you know, write out that they're something that they're going to be a part of, and that they're going to kind of sign up to certain kinds of expectations. And then I'm not saying let them loose, but, you know, kind of let them be part of the network so that other people can get access to these really rich and enriching networks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Maria. And I think that's so important to, to highlight that, you know, formality, informality, you know, there's such a there is such a range and scale of how do we run the network, depending, as I, as I said at the beginning, kind of where we are and what we want to do and what's, what, what feels right for us to, to be able to be members. And I think there are some things we want to put in place, for example, to make them inclusive or transformative that it sometimes doesn't happen of its own. And I think that's a lot of what Rana was also saying, that how we have to be intentional to make those belonging, spaces of belonging and true inclusion. So Welcome back, everyone. Um, I see we're slowly but surely increasing in the numbers as people are uh, coming back through the virtual uh, space from one room to the next. Um, so hopefully you had uh, very nice conversations in your um, small groups. Uh, we would love to read more about your um, chat, so please do post your reflections or questions, uh, comments um, into the chat. Um, I, uh, putting hands up, I am slightly behind uh, schedule as the chair, so I'm afraid we won't have necessarily time to take on a question um, right now, but uh, there is definitely already some uh, follow-up activity in the making, so we'll, we'll come back to your questions um, in, uh, in a written format after, after the session. So do please pose them into the chat so we can come back to you. Um, so then uh, we are um, just a few minutes to wrap up the, the, the workshop um, and we will do it by um, offering some tips and tricks uh, from practice um, that our speakers have used or come across and um, are able to, to share. Um, so um, uh, Joseph, uh, is it alright if I put you on the spot and maybe ask you to start, uh, start us off with maybe your top uh, takeaway uh, tip and trick and we'll, we'll share the rest um, later on. Yeah, again, thanks everyone for being patient with me here. Uh, but uh, I think what I've seen at work uh, for most of the young people is not being too rigid. I think uh, uh, Maria talked about not over manage uh, the network. 
uh, that's really very important uh, because when you're starting it, some people don't understand the value of it. And like if you're really too rigid or over managing it, uh, you will uh, easily kick them out, they will go. Um, and so enabling it to flow, being patient with it and being intentional on continuing to identify the, the, the strength in people and like understanding their needs and work with them to understand the value of the network. Uh, of course, that also has to connect the long-term uh, vision you may have for it. I, I think that helps. And, you know, we are human beings. We are social beings. That means we need each other, even when we are, you know, those kind of people who don't want, you know, who have no, you know, talent or interest to talk much. We, we still inside, we need each other. And so to me, I feel like, there's no way we can change the world or change ourselves without networks. Yeah. Thanks so much, Joseph. That was so powerful. The people-centric uh, view, that's, that's, that's great. Thanks so much. Anyone else, please go ahead. I'm happy to just go. I was just maybe to kind of connect on to that is um, the importance of identity in a network and how um, it's important that people that when we, when we're either creating a network or we're part of a network is to feel that that internal feeling that we're part of that network. So it's part of who we are. Um, because the more that we kind of do that in our networks, the more that we feel that it's that um, it's part of who we are, or the, the, the sense that we give that to people in our networks, the more chance that they're going to be mobilized to be involved. So the more that like in a school, for example, if we tell the pupils in the school, and then the mentors that might be coming in that are alumni, if we all tell them that they're part of the same community and the same network, and that that's part of who they are as being part of this community, and they internalize that, then they're more likely to be involved because they feel the sense of belonging. So that would be what I, you know, is what, you know, I, I always use this alum from day one idea. So from the moment that you start, you start to tell people that they are now part of a community and a network, and then that becomes embedded. And so you set a good tone right from the beginning. Uh, I'll jump off uh, what Maria said in the sense that I think have confidence in yourself. Tell your story, share your opinion, uh, talk about how you feel and, and don't feel intimidated. You know, if you, uh, and I think back to that point of role models from all over the world, we, and because people need to see people who look like them, who speak like them, uh, and that encourages others. So don't think that you're just another person. You are unique, your biology, nobody has your same DNA. So you have a, something to give to the world. Uh, it's a fresh perspective. So share it openly and be confident. Uh, and then that's how together, as Jova said, we can all change together. Yeah, and to add to this, I think like when networks are at their most powerful, they make people happier and like more inspired in their work. And the output and impacts of that can be really strong. I think like, networks are really making a difference in the sector. So we are seeing like those networks are really effective in achieving our vision and contributing to systemic change in education. Like it really, really is a benefit for people who engage with the network. Amazing, thank you so much everyone for offering your um, insights and for being here today. Um, it, was, it was lovely hearing all everyone's inputs and experiences and stories and I'll pass over to Anina to, to um, wrap us up. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jan. And thank you so much, Rana, Maria, Margot, and Joseph. And of course, all you incredibly active participants for a fantastic conversation. Now I'd like to hear like everybody's own takeaway, take home message. What one thing are you taking home from this session? And again, please type it on the chat. I personally loved Margot, your uh, comment about networks beating the system, that was such an empowering message so that by connecting, we can, we can drive change, although we are small little crumbles, but when we join those forces, we can actually create change. Love that. And I think that came from all of you in some different format. Um, also, in the spirit of networking, if you'd like all your participants, if you'd like to continue the conversation with someone, it is more than okay to share your contact details. Uh, on the chat, we will be saving it, but I, I also recommend you all like copy pasting whoever, you, if, if somebody drops their email there, be quick and copy paste it. And um, 
what what else i will use this final minute to promote our final summit session that starts in 45 minutes it's hosted by our country leads uh and this session is about intergenerational diversity and how how to harness the power of generations and challenge the persistent age group thinking love that so also like if you want to network with people from different age groups i think this is your chance and the zoom link to this chat i think one of my colleagues will drop it drop it there too and yeah, also all of our main sessions uh, for Summit are now online uh, for on-demand watching. So if you're interested in finding out what are the other 99 leading innovations in, in addition to InHive and Yarn, you can download the report or watch the global collection launch on our site at 100.org. But all righty, uh, further ado, I think it's uh, we're in my my time zone. It's it's 40, 4, 45 time to wrap up. So this conversation has been so warm and flowy. It almost aches to to say say goodbye, but it's time. And uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you once more, everybody, and have the loveliest day or evening ahead. Bye.